Welcome to Let's Talk Tennessee, your weekly podcast from the Tennessee chapter of the National Council on Severe Autism. This is episode 13, and today is February 10th, 2024. I am Jackie Cancier, your host for this podcast, and joining me today is our very special guest, Rachel Smith. Hello, my name is Rach. Nice to meet you. I'm looking forward to talking more on our podcast. Great. Thank you, Rachel, for being here today. Before we get into this week's content, we do have an announcement. And the reason that Rachel is joining us today is because she is now our new Tennessee State Chair. I have stepped down because I have accepted another role, which will be disclosed soon. But Rachel has graciously accepted this new position. And you'll note down in the corner where above where it says the world needs your voice. We do have a new email address for the organization. The website, everything is staying the same, but the email has changed. It's now hello at tncsa.org, and that will ensure that Rachel gets your messages. So from now on, if you would like to contact the organization, please use the new email, hello at tncsa.org. So before we go too far into the week, Rachel, would you like to give us a little bit of your background on why you decided to serve the new chapter when we started it? Sure. Um, I am a mother of a child with profound autism. And one thing I found over the years, the last decade, as a matter of fact, that there's very little representation for individuals with profound or severe autism. And it's really something we work toward changing, but it's just a slow change. My daughter has behavioral and IDD, so she's MHIDD, a dual diagnosis. We have a hard time finding care for her in the state. She's fixing to be 14 years old. And out of that, I started advocating because I was one of the first families. Uh, we were one of the first families in ECF choices. And I've just kept working toward being changing policy, changing procedures, and doing things to make family's lives easier in Tennessee. And that's just me in a nutshell. You also serve, you're on the East Planning and Policy Council for yes. BIDD as well. Correct. Yeah. And there will be a new behavioral uh, ca- uh, committee coming up as well. And I will be serving on that as well because we are moving forward in Tennessee for individuals that are duly diagnosed. Yeah, I've been really encouraged by the progress, especially that coming out of DIDD. I mm-hmm. I wish that accelerated motivation was replicated on 10 care side, um, but yeah. I have been really encouraged by DIDD's response and to the need and to the unmet right. needs of, of this population. So Mm -hmm. that's encouraging. It really is. Yes, it is. So we did not have a podcast last week because we had a webinar by Dr. Joshua Ryan Smith, and that was what we uploaded last week. Dr. Smith came on and talked to us about catatonia and specifically in pediatric and neurodiverse populations and some of the challenges with that. And I thought this week we would just review a couple of little clips from Dr. Smith's webinar. One of the great things about the webinar is Dr. Smith did talk about profound autism. And let's hear what he had to say about that. So just as a quick review, the Lancet Commission for the Future of Clinical Care for Autism um, released a article in 2021, and basically they introduced this term profound autism. And profound autism, as you, you guys probably all well know, it was sort of um, it was contested as to whether this was a, a good idea to to use this nomenclature. But it means requiring 24 hour access to an adult who can care for or folks likely for the remainder of their lives, being unable to live alone or attend to basic daily needs. IQ less than 50 and limited verbal ability. And we'll use this term today. So he described profound autism, but then he goes in to explain why this matters to him. And what I'd like to point out, too, is that autism may present with or without intellectual disability or a minimally verbal or non-speaking status. And that's super important because the prevalence of intellectual disability, depending on the research you read, is about 30 to 50 percent of autistic individuals. But 
in autism clinical research, there are only folks with comorbid intellectual disability are only included about five to six percent of clinical research. And unfortunately, it looks like that number is worsening over time. So part of what Dr. Lord and colleagues from the Lancet Commission are trying to do to describe the term profound autism was to say, hey, we know this needs to be researched. If we use this uh, term, we may be able to you know, more uh, accurately describe what people are experiencing and, and conduct research on it. And so that was the the intention behind it. And we've seen this before. We've seen some debate within the community over using the term profound autism. And just what, a couple months ago, our chapter did do a blog post about this following an article that came out of the Washington Post. So in the Washington Post article, Dr. Amy Lutz, who is the vice president of National Council on Severe Autism, as well as Allison Singer, who is the president for the Autism Science Foundation. They were featured in that article with discussions for support of the term profound autism. And then there was also the discussion of against the term. And I think it's important to note that but Dr. Smith was saying that we need this kind of term for research purposes. And we did a blog post, it's called The Good Life back in November. And you can go to our website and see that post as to why we feel we need that terminology. But five to six percent of our children being represented is in this research is really how we got into this. Um, Yeah, you know, we we hear so many families wondering why we don't have more services, why nobody seems to understand what it is our kids are going through. And right there is your answer, because what a lot of people don't recognize is that these policies, they're not just people writing things down because they feel like it, or this is what they think our kids want. They are basing it. They're trying to do their due diligence. They use research and surveys and evidence and that informs the policy. But what happens when our kids aren't represented in that research, we get to where we are now. So we present it to the emergency department and like many agitated kids or adults who present to emergency departments, he got haloperidol and lorazepam. Haloperidol is a um, antipsychotic and again, it can potentially worsen symptoms of catatonia. And I felt that this is really important to talk about because he does show this person went to an ER, but this particular ER did not understand the specialized treatment and diagnoses regarding this child. And so they gave them haloperidol, which is common, and it actually made things worse. We were in that position recently when my daughter had to go to that low local county ER, and they were insisting that, you know, they wanted to give her Howdall. And and fortunately, because I knew that this was not something that she should have having catatonia, I was able to advocate against that. But they had no other options for medication to treat her. And so we were unable to get her stabilized, even though we went to an ER. And that's really the challenge with some of these smaller rural county hospitals is they do not have the training or sometimes even the medications that might be needed to treat our population. I was very interested in when he was talking about, I think he called it the Ativan test. Mm -hmm. And when they started challenge, yeah, yeah, the Ativan challenge, you're correct. Yeah. And I was trying to understand that more because I'm new to this area myself with my daughter and understanding it. And so I was really interested to know they had a way to kind of test between what was it he was saying? The behavior, if it was based on catatonia, it would you would see a difference. Yeah, yeah you would be adamant. responsive to the benzodiazepam treatment. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, because like he said, it's such a <coughs> low risk process. Why not mm-hmm. try try the out of it? Yeah. Yeah. That was a good start to me. I thought it was very interesting. Um, and um, they were able to tell a lot just from that. Yeah, I'm really hoping that we, we develop some type of way to ensure that the smaller rural hospitals in Tennessee are able to get this Mm -hmm. higher level of training for our population. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go into that a little bit about just Mm -hmm. how dire of a need that is here coming up. So no inpatient psychiatric facilities in Tennessee or Georgia were um, willing to accept him for inpatient care. This is not uncommon. So in our 
sort of tri-state area, the only uh, inpatient psychiatric facility for folks with profound impairment is Laurel Heights in Atlanta. And so he was declined by all facilities. So he talks about how no hospital in the tri-state area would accept this Mm -hmm. child who needed to be admitted. And so he was sent home for his parents to have to stabilize him. And how Mm -hmm. many times have we been through that? Have we heard other families in our chapter been through that? And so when we talk about needing to have defined terms and differences to be able to describe the difference in the needs Mm -hmm. of of our population, because those needs are not being met. And what parents are being asked to do is really just an impossible feat. It really is. And our Mm -hmm. children are the ones that suffer for it. So the whole video is available on YouTube and it also is up on audio format on all of our podcast channels. So if you didn't get a chance to catch Dr. Smith's webinar, we highly encourage you to go and watch that. It was really a great webinar. Okay, and that could, that's going to take us into a story that came out of Disability Scoop this week. We posted it on our Facebook page if you didn't get a chance, but it's called Lack of Resources to Address Severe Behaviors Leaves Families with Few Options. And first of all, the story was extraordinarily familiar, too much so, and infuriating and heartbreaking. But what was so interesting to me when I was reading it is this is a family out of North Carolina whose 19-year-old severely autistic son was needing to be admitted into a specialized unit. And although North Carolina has specialized units, unlike Tennessee, there was a two-year wait list. And so he couldn't get into a local specialized unit. The interesting thing is they sent him to Tennessee. And this article doesn't go into this part. But when I read that, I was like, where did they send him in Tennessee? We don't we don't have anywhere. I have a 20 year old who's in need of (laughs) admission, you know, a couple of times a year. And we've never been able to admit her. So where did they send her? And they sent him to a place called the ranch. And I then looked into that. Let me share my screen. I can show you this place. So this is the place that they sent this young man to. It's called The Ranch. And I was looking to see what kind of programs they have for somebody that has severe autism in a psychiatric distress crisis situation that they're requiring admission. Our programs at Tennessee, trauma and PTSD treatment, process addictions treatment, personality disorder, mood disorder, sex addiction and intimacy disorders, dual diagnosis treatment, and substance abuse. Quite alarming. So I thought, okay, maybe they mean dual diagnosis treatment, the kind that we need treatment for, mental health and intellectual disability. But no, it's substance abuse disorder, including addiction and alcoholism. Look at these programs. We're talking addiction, drug drug and alcohol, men's rehab, women's rehab, you know, this is this is not a specialized unit for somebody that is in need of treatment for autism. Right. And I have no idea why North Carolina tried to tell this family that this was an appropriate place to send their child. And it was tragic. This facility told the family that they would be able to help their son. They talked with the facility. They trusted when they sent their son there, having no idea what kind of place this really was. And they told the facility that they were sending their son there because uh, they were dealing with an increase in aggression that was too difficult for them to handle. And they had a younger daughter that they needed to consider. This facility assured them that they would be able to manage it. Yet within three days after the son was sent there, the family who's out of state gets a call that their child, who has a seven to eight-year-old cognitive capacity, had been put in jail. Apparently, he had had an aggressive episode with another patient there, and they called the police, put him in handcuffs, and put him in jail. Like an absolute nightmare for this family. And it was just so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. I, for the life of me, cannot understand why he was ever sent to this facility. Mm Mm-mm. Makes no sense whatsoever. No, no. I just, I felt so 
angry and heartbroken for that family. I really did. I, we, I don't understand the facility <clears throat> thinking they can actually treat yeah. at that level. Yeah, this is what we continue. It's not, I feel like we're beating a dead horse over and over, but yet I also feel like we have to because <laughs> we still have the services. This is what we're talking about. It requires specialized care. We cannot just send our kids to any treatment program or to any hospital. Our kids need specialized care. And that's not what was going to be available at this location. And it's just heartbreaking that that's where they sent him to. So in Tennessee, we do not have specialized units. If you're watching this from out of state, do not get duped into sending your kids to Tennessee because we do not have anywhere to send our own kids. It's not that they're on a wait list. The facilities do not exist. So this issue regarding crisis care and what do we do? It's something we've been discussing over prior podcasts. We have shared some of our own personal experiences. We opened the very first webinar we ever did. Rachel, you were one of the panelists in that webinar talking about the inequities in Tennessee and how our children do not have access to the services that they need. And recently, I've been sharing about some of our pitfalls regarding the healthcare system when my daughter went into crisis. And I've been doing my research on that. It's alarming. Tennessee, we have a problem in West Tennessee. It is not just... But let me show you some. I really want to get kind of your reaction. You know, Rachel, you, you've heard me talking about this, but um, mm-hmm. I want to show you some of these maps and some of the information that I've been finding of just how big of an issue this is with West Tennessee specifically. (laughs) And I really think that this is something that I'm hoping DIDD and other agencies will be able to address quickly once they Mm -hmm. see just how big this problem is. So this map is from the Department of Mental Health and it shows the crisis intervention teams in Tennessee. And you'll see based on the key here that these light gray areas mean there is no CIT at this time. The blue areas just means that there's outreach or the first responders are considering getting a CIT. But this light blue, light gray is mean they're not considering it. There's no outreach and there's no crisis intervention team. Now, crisis intervention teams are 40 hours of training for first responders specific to mental health and intellectual developmental disability dog diagnosis specific to our population. So when we call for help, when we call 911, a CIT team responding is going to be able to know what to expect coming into that. They're going to be less likely to misread the situation or to escalate the situation, they're going to be more likely to be helpful. But let's look over here at West Tennessee. Do you see that? This big 16 county block Mm -hmm. of no CIT training anywhere here. Now, the makeup of those 16 counties, I took a look at the demographics from the last census, all except McNary County are very rural and isolated. Mm -hmm. Right. And some of them 100 percent rural and isolated, according to the most recent census. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean when I say that they're rural and isolated? I'm saying they do not have the infrastructure. They do not have big, major hospitals that are able to (laughs) provide that specialized treatment like Dr. Smith might provide at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. They're reliant on local county hospitals, these local county hospitals that, as we've talked in in prior podcasts, EMS are forced to transport to the local hospital. They're often two plus hours away from a major hospital. Those four major hospitals, they're located in Memphis, Nashville, Chattanooga and Knoxville. That's what we have as our major hospitals in the state. And yet this area in West Tennessee (laughs) is nowhere close to those hospitals. Then I looked at it with Tennessee START maps because 
Hennessy Start is designed specifically for our population. That They're an amazing program. You know, we've been in promotional videos for them. I love Tennessee Start and I, I love that we have something that is special for us. However, the Jackson region does not have crisis response right now. They've had to suspend crisis response. They're still doing outreach that's scheduled. But as far as crisis response, if you call and say, hey, you know, I need assistance. You know, my child is in an active episode right now. They are unable to respond to crisis response because of understaffing. Look at the Jackson region. The Jackson region there is in orange. 14 of the 16 counties in this block here are in the Jackson region without access to crisis response. The only two counties that are over in the Nashville region are Hickman and Lewis. All of the other counties in this gray block with no CIT training are in the Jackson region with no crisis response. So they're hours from a major hospital. They don't have CIT training and there's no start crisis response. There is no safety net for 14 counties in West Tennessee. This is a huge issue that we need the state to expediently address. Our safety net programs are a big thing about us being keeping our families in the community. Um, yes. And that's they need to be uh, a low, whole lot better than what we have today. And I hope to see that in the next decade, hopefully. You make an excellent point that in order for our children to remain in the community, which, you know, our kids could have 350 out of 356 days of the year that are okay. But in those few days a year that are beyond what we or the school or anyone else can manage on their own, we have to be able to call for help. Right, right now, as a Henry County resident, which is the northern county on, in West Tennessee in that block that I was showing you, as a Henry County resident, I cannot call for help. I don't have an answer when we're trying to develop a crisis plan and talking with the school on what they can do if they need to call for help. I don't have an answer for them. I think of how many other families in this region are experiencing the same thing. I don't want to see any person lose their access to the community simply because they don't have the immediate stabilization crisis response they need for such a short term. Mm -hmm episodic intermittent issue but we we really need better systems in place and it's going to take completely reimagining healthcare delivery it just our current mental health general health these two different hospitals everything's so siloed this really splintered bifurcated system just is not appropriate for out, the needs of our children. There is an exciting new model that came to Hermitage called Kramer Davis, and they use a transdisciplinary approach to healthcare, which is really designed to be appropriate for children like ours with severe and profound autism, intellectual disability with comorbid conditions. And that program was founded by Dr. Matthew Holder and Dr. Henry Hood. And Dr. Matthew Holder is going to be doing a webinar for us here on next Friday, Friday, February 16th. So go to tncsa.org forward slash KD for Kramer Davis. And you can register for that webinar. It's going to be amazing. But I think that this really should guide how we look at healthcare, you know, and really building and expanding on this model across the board. And this is something that we're going to need to look more into for our hospitals and our inpatient stays. But it does our children no good to try to pinpoint a surface symptom without access to that whole biopsychosocial approach. So that is our transition. We'll call this the transition podcast between uh, the old state chair and the new state chair. Again, Rachel, thank you so much for stepping out to do this. With Rachel stepping into the state chair position, we do have an opening for the vice chair position now. So Rachel has some ideas and she's going to be interviewing to fill that. But if you're interested in that, then please reach out to hello at tncsa.org to let her know. And Rachel, do you want to talk a little bit about any ideas you have coming forward or... 
Well, as far as Tennessee goes, uh, our chapter, we will be reaching out to our members a whole lot more this year, um, you know, just to set that up. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, uh, collaborating and innovating with more parents and caregivers. So I'm all about the caregivers. So I'm looking out to start talking to them. You really yeah. are. You are a caregiver champion. I, I can say, you know, I I work with Rachel across different platforms, both in NCSA, but also, you know, on the councils and things. And that is really just caregivers, siblings, Mm -hmm. trauma-informed care. These are really Rachel's bread and butter. And so I'm really excited as to how she's going to interject that and bring her passion into a direction for the chapter. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you. And I would just ask that all the members and the other directors really kind of wrap around her. It is a lot of responsibility and it's a hard role. So um, I hope that they will all be wrapping around you. And I, I will be here to support you as well. I'm not You're going anywhere. Me. I'm just moving into a different position. Mm-hmm. So. For sure. Sure. We couldn't do without you. No, well, you could, and you're going to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I could. It, I think the reverse is actually quite true. You know, I Thank you. I know that it's hard for a lot of families to go forward and go public and things like that. So mm-hmm. I've been the one to be willing to do that. But I these aren't just my stories. They're not. Just, right. It's not just my projects or anything like that. I am continually provided support and guidance through the community. And I hope that you will be as well. I know you will be. And so congratulations. Thank you. And I think that that might be all we have for this week. I know that you'll be getting with Stevie. You and Stevie will be coordinating. Stevie is our communications director. So Rachel and Stevie will be coordinating how the podcast goes moving forward. But we just ask the community to be a little patient. It might take a couple of weeks to transition as Rachel decides how she wants to proceed with the chapter. Um, For sure. On our social media. Lots of fun. Fun ahead. Fun ahead. I have no doubt with that. You are quite a person. (laughs) They have no idea what they're in for. (laughs) No. It's okay, though. (laughs) 